um, I do, I do kind of see this a little bit like a, like a, like a show, if you will, a little bit like a TV show. And, uh, and um, what we read last week in, in Elijah's story is he sees, he, he encounters God. I don't say he sees God. He does, he does encounter God. And um, if you recall, God comes by him in a mighty wind, uh, in an earthquake, in, uh, in fire. And God is not in any of those symbols. Um, but God is in the soft murmuring sounds, still small voice. So he encounters God. And God says to Elijah, where are you, Elijah? Where are you? Why are you here? Where are you? Who are you? What's going on, Elijah? Why are you here? This is, of course, an interesting question for God, the omnipotent, omniscient God to ask Elijah. Because doesn't Elijah, I mean, doesn't God know what Elijah's there for? I mean, so... Elijah's answer, again, was, I have been moved by zeal for the Lord. You know, I'm the only one. I'm the, I'm the last one. They're trying to kill me. And I'm just doing your work, God. I am, I am moved by zeal, right? And, you know, we didn't really talk about this a couple weeks ago. At this point, it's almost like he's fishing for a compliment from God. He's, he's fishing for some reinforcement from God. Way to go, Elijah. You are my best prophet. You're my only prophet. Everybody else doesn't get it, but you do, Elijah. You do, you are zealous for me. You're you're the right guy. He doesn't say that. Is it possible that God doesn't say where are you in terms of location, but where are you in terms of what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. Rather than location. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, like his, because God knows where he is. Yeah. And he, and he really, his answer to him right. is, okay, you've come to see me. And he basically is, I wouldn't say complaining, but he's definitely not, he's not saying, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I love you, God. And, and that's, you know, I try to do your work all the time. Uh, because what he really is saying, everyone is trying to kill me. I'm doing your work. And it's almost as if he's saying to God, you know, what are you, like, why am I here? Like, why am I here? Why am I even on this planet? And if you think that that's too far-fetched, remember what he had said while he was on his way to see God, he actually said to him, and remember God, you know, uh, he had already told God, you know, they had already had that conversation, why are you here? It was the second time. But when uh, Elijah ran away, remember what he had said. He had said to God, take my life for I'm no better than my father's. So he actually cried out and, you know, he says he prayed that he might die. So he doesn't really want to be here. I mean, he sa it says, I mean, we know that he's kind of reached the end of his rope. And when he encounters God, God doesn't exactly, you know, give him an answer of, yeah, you know, you've got this, Elijah. I believe in you. Stop wanting to kill yourself. Instead, he literally tells him what to do, right? He told him, we read this two weeks ago, he tells him, go back. And he, by the way, notice he says, go back the way you came. And that's the Hebrew. Shuv, the dar go back your way. Which, by the way, could also be understood as not a geographical way. <laughs> Your way. It's the same way. It's the, we use the same word in English, right? Your way. It's your way, you know? It's your way or the highway. We're not talking about, like, you know, the direction you came. It's the way you do things, right? So he says, go back your way. And it's the same word in Hebrew, derech. And then he tells them. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, he says, go back your way. And he, again, he never gives Elijah any words of encouragement. He never says to Elijah, it's okay. You're the only one doing my stuff. Great job. You're, you're, 
you're the only one left and I'm going to protect you and it's all going to be okay. He actually just tells them, go back and do your job. I mean, maybe I've overstated it. Maybe I've overstated it, but he really doesn't give him any words of encouragement. He basically goes back and says, go do prophecy work. Go, and he doesn't say it's going to be okay. He doesn't say I'm with you even. He says, I mean, what he first says to him is go back, go make Hazael the king of, of Aram, of Syria. Okay, which, which by itself, by the way, is not exactly a safe journey because you're going to another country as an Israelite, a war, a country you're at war with, and you're going there and you're going to go tell the king of another country, hey, I'm going to make you king or a, 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 a prince of another country. I'm going to make you king. Okay, well, that's first of all, not exactly the easy an easy job. It's not just like saying go back and go back to your job. You go back and do something hard. Then he says, on top of it, go and make go make uh, Yehu the next king of Israel, which is not from Ahab's family. So he's basically saying you're going to go anoint another guy to be king, which is traitorous. I mean, on the face of it, he could be killed for doing that. Not an easy thing to do either. Go make another, create another dynasty. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you mean? It's, we don't know. Okay. So doesn't say why. It's the same thing. But Jonah, right? We're going to read Jonah's story tomorrow, uh, Wednesday. Jonah gets told, go to, go to the Assyrians and go tell them to repent, which is also along similar lines, not an easy thing to do. And like Elisha, you know, the previous generation, great prophet, Jonah's from the next generation, next generations. Jonah uh, doesn't want to do it. We don't know here specifically that Elijah doesn't want to do it, but both of them were suicidal. Both of them had suicidal ideation, as we say now. They at least wanted or expressed a feeling like they wanted to die. We don't know that they acted on that suicidal thought, but they definitely didn't want to be here. And it says, it's, so hard to be a prophet. it's either too hard to be a prophet or these guys, their default to some extent, or at least I don't want to say all the time, but at least at one point in their lives was, I don't want to do this job anymore. I don't want to live if I have to do this job. Well, look, pro being a prophet is not an easy thing to do, right, Marsha? Because no one wants to hear bad news. You're going to see that today. Don't bring me bad, no bad news, right? It's like saying the whiz. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is not an easy job. And then the third thing he has to do is he has to make he has to make Elisha the next prophet, his next prophet. Actually, his next prophet. He's going to be succeeding you as a prophet, which, by the way, I mean, on the face of it, it's good because Elijah gets to now know who he picks as a successor, which is a great thing, you know, to know who's going to take, you know, you, you handpick somebody. Like, you know, that's the, that's what everybody wants. I mean, there was a, I saw last night, uh, Nancy Pelosi was, t I guess it was the night before, she was telling Colbert about how she was picked by her predecessor in San Francisco. The woman called her in before she died and said, I want you to be my, I want you to have my congressional seat, which she said was one of the first times a woman ever told another woman, I want you to, I want you to succeed me. So I thought it was interesting that, you know, that stuff happens, plays out all the time with men, but it hasn't played out for, for very long, at least in the world of what women do. I'm sure women picked, you know, women to lead if they were in a matriarchal society, but not in a patriarchal society like we've been for most of the last several thousand years. So pick your successor, which by the way, also I want to point out, isn't exactly a ringing endorsement. You know, is God here trying to say to some extent, Elijah, you, yeah, you want to be done? Okay. We got, we got a successor for you. I got somebody who can fill your shoes. So I'm not really sure that this moment that, that that Elijah has, you know, we oftentimes say, well, Elijah gets to meet God on Mount Sinai like Moses had. And, you know, he gets, he gets to talk to God. I'm not sure it was a great experience for Elijah. And I don't know that anyone's ever said, oh, look how lucky Elijah was. He got to talk to God on Mount Sinai in a still small voice. 
but people usually take away from it that God speaks in a still small voice and whatever. I mean, most people don't say Elijah had a bad experience here, but it is possible that this is not, this can't always necessarily be read as, well, look how lucky Elijah is because God talked to him. Because I don't know that the answer he got from God was so good. Do you think Elijah was really looking for God? Or was God, or was Elijah hiding in the cave? Well, that's a good question because he is he is he is filling the he is the order that the, the angel had told him, the angel that had fed him while he was running away, told him this is what you this is what you do. So he's following directions, but yeah, I mean I don't I don't know that I don't know that Elijah wanted to, to to do this, but you can make the argument that he wants to talk to God. Most people see that most people read the story today as one of the lesson that we can take away from Elijah, which is if you talk to God, it might not be the way you think it will be. It might be in the still small voice, right? So quiet yourself. Don't look for God in the big signs, right? Don't look for God in in uh the burning bushes or the not even the burning bushes don't look for god in 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 mount sinai but but try to hear god in the still small voice that's what most people pull away from this in a in a positive way right or, or in a in a in a um how in a in, in kind of an encouraging way and maybe god maybe you're looking for god in bigger signs but there's another issue which is if you ask god for answers you may not like the answer. And that's what I'm telling. That's what I, that's one of my takeaways from this is that he get he got an answer, but was this the answer that he wanted? And um, you know, we we see Elijah as a hero, right? Elijah is is in our tradition the greatest prophet besides Moses. I mean, there's Moses and then there's Elijah. And the other prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they're all great, but they don't do the stuff that Elijah does. We don't invite any of them to our Passover seders. We're not, we don't, we don't invoke Elijah's name for anything else. Elijah clearly is pretty important, but I'm not sure that number one, his life was that easy, which shouldn't be that surprising, but I'm not even sure that he was really, I'm not sure that at least in the Bible, his, his, the way they wrap their heads around him, that he was so, um, he was so together that maybe he's a little he, there, he's a little touched, if you will. I mean, I don't use that word, but you know that he was that there was something about him that probably made it difficult for him to exist in the world. Uh, you know, I don't want to say he had, had a mental health issue, but that maybe this was something that was not as was more complicated and maybe more negative than we. Than we think. We normally think Elijah lasts forever and can, can can live forever, is living forever, can keep going back and forth between heaven and earth, and that this is some kind of uh, reward. This is a good thing. There's also a possibility that Elijah is almost it, it's hinted at, but I'm going to say it that Elijah is kind of punished by this. That Elijah has to figure out how to have more compassion for humanity. And that's why he has to keep doing this because he's really good at being a prophet. He talks to God, but there's something missing when it comes to the way he thinks about people. Like he's moved for, for zeal to God. That's what it says, right? He's moved by zeal. I moved by zeal for the Lord. But maybe you need to have more than that, right? Maybe having zeal for God, but having very little compassion for human beings doesn't really make you a great prophet. It maybe doesn't make you a very nice person. So there's a possibility that Elijah just doesn't get it and that his work in the world and why he has to keep coming back and why he has to be here as the intermediary is because he still has to like humans a little bit more. It's a possibility. So as I said, I said it because it's hinted at and I'm not the only person who's who's kind of gone that direction, but this idea that he might not be the hero, the full hero of this story. So again, he basically says uh, what we read last time is that, you know, God is going to take vengeance with these guys. Uh, Yehu is going to be uh, have vengeance uh, for God. Uh, Hazael is. And now Elisha will too. 
because Alicia is going to be your successor. And he goes and finds Alicia. He goes out, and this is what we finish with. Um, Alicia says to Elijah, hey, can I go back and kiss my father and mother goodbye? And he says, go back. What have I done to you? Um, most people say, hey, he gives them permission. But it also could indicate that Elijah, again, as I said, doesn't really get human beings, which is here's a guy who just wants to say goodbye to his parents. And he's like, go get out of here. Because it can be very, I mean, we're not really sure what he's saying here, but it seems somewhat dismissive. It seems like he almost says, just go back. And that's why I'm saying it's part of it's part of a picture of Elijah that might not be completely rosy, which is that there is a possibility that some people who are moved by zeal to God, who are really good at following God's word and who are passionate for God, don't get it because they don't care for people. You care for God, but if you don't care for people, what are you doing? I mean, what are you, why are you a problem? What are you here for? How can you serve God if you don't care about people? So it's an interesting question. Again, maybe it's uh, more of a modern question, but I don't know. I don't know if our ancestors didn't kind of wrap their heads around that too. So again, Elijah is definitely a loner in the tradition. And by that, I mean, not just the Torah, but the Midrash as well. Elijah is not, Elijah is not with other people. We'll take a look at, at share some of that with you too. No, he's, he doesn't have a wife. There's no Elijah wife and Elijah family. All right. So uh, Rosemary, would you uh, take us through chapter 20, uh, chapter 20? Okay. King Ben-Hadad of Aram gathered his whole army. 32 kings accompanied him with horses and chariots. He advanced against Samaria, laid siege to it, and attacked it. And he sent messengers to Ahab inside the city to say to him, Thus said Ben-Hadad, Your silver and gold are mine, and your beautiful wives and children are mine. Yeah, so so I, I just want to point something out. So Ben-Hadad is not the guy we read about. Hazael was the guy that uh, Elijah was supposed to anoint. This is the previous, this was the current, whatever, the pre, the king before Hazael. So we can, you can probably understand that Ben-Hadad is not the guy that Elijah is supposed to be talking with, but he's of the same country. It's Aram, it's Syria, just north, east. It's modern day Damascus. So he's, he's going to war against Israel, which is in the north, right? So he's laying siege to Samaria, the capital. And he says to Ahab, uh, your silver and gold are mine and your beautiful wives and children. Now I will tell you, before you say, oh, he just wants the hot women. Is that what he just said, right? Do you just want my beautiful wives? No, I will tell you, uh, the, 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 the adjective tovim is on the kids too. So maybe, maybe it is a specific, not by tov meaning beautiful, but the ones that are the good ones, because tov means good, right? But maybe the ones that are the the ones that would be king or queen after you, you know, the ones that are actually heirs, the ones that are actually, yeah, don't send me out the ones that, don't send me out the kids that are never going to be rulers that, you know, have no, yeah, don't send me out your juvenile delinquents. So there is a possibility because he didn't just send me, send all your wives and kids. He didn't say that. He did say the Tovim, the good ones. Again, maybe all of your kids are good, but whatever it means, I do want to point out, it doesn't mean just send me out your beautiful wives. Okay. That's not what he said. Beautiful, beautiful wives and beautiful children, the adjectives on both. So I thought that was funny when I read it. I'm like, did, did I, did I miss something there? Uh, but here's the critical thing. You hear something like that. And you're like, oh, he's basically laying siege to it and saying, you know, if you want to, if you want me to leave, this is what you have to do. Now, Here's what uh, here's what happens with Ahav, and basically, by the way, we already know Ahav is a bad guy. You know, he chased he chased Elijah away with his wife Jezebel. Um, Ahav and Jezebel are bad people. There's no question they're bad people. Really bad. You're going to see exactly why. We actually talked about it on Wednesday night class. Interestingly, about how bad they are, um, because we'll actually read they violate a Torah law here, um, but. Uh, Ahab doesn't seem to understand what uh, Ben-Hadad just asked for. Here's what happens. 
The king of Israel replied, as you say, my lord king, I and all I have are yours. Then the messengers came again and said, thus said Ben-Hadad, when I sent you the order to give me your silver and gold and your wives and children, I meant that tomorrow at this time, I will send my servants to you and they will search your house and the houses of your courtiers and seize everything you prize and take it away. So, so he sends them back. A he, so Ahav sends a message and says, yes, I, I'll pay you, right? I'll pay you to go away. Then that seems to be like, hey, you sent me the message. I want to get paid off to go away and I, I'll pay you away. And the messengers come back and go, no, no, you don't understand. We're taking everything. We're putting the, we're driving the U-Haul up to the house, up to your palace, and we're taking everything. So he's saying, this isn't, this wasn't figurative. This wasn't polite language of discourse of, of negotiation. We're taking everything. Wow. This is a great conversation, right? So we've definitely gone back to Ahav and to his, to his belt. Well, there's dialogue. There's dialogue. There's there's a there's an act going on here, and we actually get to see this. We get to see that, right? We got to see not just that you know Ahav was held for you know they were they were negotiating. You know that the Bible didn't just say that. They actually gave us the exchange, which is you thought I was speaking metaphorically. Uh uh everything. So here's what happens. Then the king of Israel summoned all the elders of the land, and he said, see for yourselves how that man is bent on evil. For when he demanded my wives and my children, my silver and my gold, I did not refuse him. All the elders and all the people said, do not obey and do not submit. So Ahav uses this now as propaganda and, and to rally his people, saying, look, I was going to pay the guy to go away. But look what he said. He said, I got to give everything. That's not normal. That's not the way we negotiate. The guy is taking everything. So he, he gets them to say, don't do it. Don't do it, Ahab. He doesn't say to the people, I'm not going to do it. He makes them say it, which is very clever, right? And it shows you how clever Ahab is, which is, you know, look, I got to have the, if we're going to have a siege and we're going to go to war, we're going to go to battle. I can't have these people think that they're fighting so that I can keep my stuff. Th that we could have bought our way out of this war. We've got to, we've got to have these people w be willing to die, which is interesting because this still happens. This still happens because essentially, to some extent, that's what happened in Ukraine. A similar thing where Zelensky was like, I you know, he says, we got to, we got to do this. Well, uh, you know, I don't think, you know, if he does it, he's doing it, but I'm not, we're not going to, you know, he basically, Zelensky got the people of Ukraine to fight because he, he, if he had simply said, well, they just want me out, then they would have said, yeah, I'll get it, Zelensky out. And he didn't do it. He literally got the people to support him and to support, I mean, he did win a democratic election, but you know, people in Ukraine don't really trust their elections, right? So the fact that he got the people to, to, to support them because they literally forced the Russians to invade. I mean, they didn't force them, but there was a way for them to back out. Wouldn't do it. And it was a very clever thing that Zelensky did, which was essentially what Akhav did, which is, I'm going to make the people be, get behind this because if they see this as my personal war, like that, you know, Russia's invading to get rid of me alone, then the people will turn on me. They'll say, yeah, get rid of this guy. But if they turn, if I turn it into he is attacking all of us, he's taking, you know, this is something that we can't back down on. You got the people. So this is really an interesting strategy that Akhav, that Akhav, and he displays his, why he's not a good king, but he's a successful king. And he's, he's a good king. He's not a good person, but he's a good king. He's good at ruling. So here's what he did. So he said to Ben-Hadad's messengers, tell my lord the king, all that you first demanded of your servant I shall do, but this thing I cannot do. The messengers went and reported this to him. Thereupon Ben-Hadad sent him this message, may the gods do thus to me and even more if the dust of Samaria will provide even a handful for each of the men who follow me. So 
um, he tells he tells Ben Haddad, I can't I, I can't do this. I can't do what you've asked me. I was going to pay you, but I can't do this. And then Haddad's message back was, "You're you're done. You're toast. You know, you will now be completely routed." And so this is what this is what um, this is what happens now is they um, they're threatened again. Samaria said they he doesn't just say I'm going to attack. Ahab, I'm going to destroy Samaria, right? Uh, yeah, his words are, the dust of Samaria will provide even a handful for each of the men who follow me. So uh, it's basically, again, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to literally wipe Samaria out. The king of Israel replied, tell him, let not him who girds on his sword boast like him who ungirds it. <laughs> On hearing this reply, while he and the other kings were drinking together at Sukkot, he commanded his followers advance, and they advanced against the city. Yeah, so. Um, and this is all in Damascus, right? The, well, no, it's Damascus, it's the Syrians, and 32 other kings that go into battle with, with Ben Haddad. So Ben Haddad has created a coalition. This is an overwhelming. This is an overwhelming show of force against against Ahab. And again, it could be other people that Ahab had gone to war with, people who are looking to get a little bit of treasure out of going to war against Israel. But this is, you know, maybe other Canaanite kings, you know, people in uh, Ammonite, Moabite, different people who don't, you know, who don't have any issue going to war against us. The question of, by the way, where Judah is during this scene, they don't seem to be involved in this, in this part, though we, we have read about how Judah before had hired the Assyrians to go to war against Israel. So it doesn't necessarily, not this case, doesn't seem to be a case where Judah is involved. I will tell you, they'll be involved in, in the way the story plays out. So I told you that they are in the background, but they haven't, they haven't been seen yet. But... Uh, this is remember. So other the other interesting thing about this to go back to some of the television and movies that we like, Hobbs a bad guy. We don't like him, but yet here we're rooting for him. And this is really clever that the Bible did this because this is like every you know, Sopranos, Breaking Bad, whatever show you want at Ozark, you're rooting for the bad guy here, and they literally just got us doing that. That's a really clever way of telling a story, which is, uh, I love those kind of stories where, and well, I guess we all do because those are the most popular shows, but they're the ones where you're like, oh, there's so much more ambiguity. Like, who do we root for? What do we do? I mean, where's the, who are the good guys? And, and we want to root for the good guys, but we can't. Yeah. <laughs> That's very tough. This is a tough one. This is a tough, this is a tough one. So we know what's going on in the background. And even Elijah doesn't seem to be fully, he's not a full hero in this either. So, all right. So here's the battle. The battle is about to be joined. And here it is. Then a certain prophet went up to King Ahab of Israel and said, thus said the Lord, do you see that great host? I will deliver it into your hands today and you shall know that I am the Lord. Through whom? Asked Ahab. He answered, thus said the Lord, through the aides of the provincial governors. He asked, who shall begin the battle? And he answered, you. Wow. So another prophet, not Elijah, goes up to Ahab and basically says, this is going to be a great battle for you. You're going to win. And how are you going to win? You are, because because Ahab at this point goes like, I can't win this war. Like, this is, this is not going to end well. And the prophet, and it doesn't say who the prophet is, by the way. This is the interesting thing. We don't know who the prophet is. And of course, the rabbis, the midrash on this is, uh, you know, it's, there's nobody, the, the, the rabbis do not like unknown people. Now, I don't want to, 
I don't want to tell you. Well, no, it's interesting. Could it have been, an angel? well, they don't defer to that, right? They don't go, they don't like the idea that an angel would even talk to a Han, but it's clearly, it does say that a prophet. So I don't want to tell you yet because you're going to see who they say it is because the prophet does pop up in this or a, another name prophet pops up in it and not, and not Elijah. So anyways, this prophet, there's other prophets. And the prophet is speaking in the name of God, Adonai. Um, it's Doug, it's our, it's our God. It's not like some other God. Uh, and he basically says, and you're going to start the battle. You go into battle. So he, and he's given them, he said, look, it's going to have to do with the way the provincial governors are working. So let's read what, yeah. So he mustered the aides of the provincial governors, 232 strong, and then he mustered all the troops, all the Israelites, 7,000 strong. They marched out at noon while Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk at Sukkot together with the 32 kings allied with him. So what's interesting about this is that here are the provincial governors. What he's saying is, is that there were there were two kinds of armies here. There was the Israelite army, Ahab's professional army, if you will. And then there's the reserves or the militias, if you will. And what, what happened is, is that um, Ahab was told that it's the provincial governors that are going to be able to deliver the troops to you today. It's not your army. It's the, it's the people that are actually going to, um, it, they're the ones who are actually going to, to be the, the the difference, if you will. So uh, 7,000, which is interesting because we read that there's only going to be 7,000 people left. So the 7,000 numbers popped up again um, because Elijah was told there's only going to be 7,000 people left in the country, which seems a little bit of an exaggeration. We didn't really talk about that again today, but that that's pretty weird that there's going to be 7,000 people left in, on the whole country and the whole Northern Kingdom. Well, uh, rabbis ever talk about um, false prophets? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a real question of whether oh you oh you're gonna see a false prophet today, and it's very weird to let this prophet this one, like people the rabbis talk about it. I'm sure there's Christian sources on this too, but I will tell you nobody's comfortable with what happens in this scene because the scene like nobody in the Nobody in the, uh, what's the right word, in the conventional uh, world of how do we read Bible, feel comfortable with what I'm about to show you in the next chapter. Rabbi, I'm so confused here. So geographically, they yeah. asked him to go over to Damascus and make this guy king. Yeah, not this guy now, no, the, no, next, no, the no, next no, guy. No, but no, by no. the way, part of the setup here, Marsha, is we're seeing how Ben-Hadad I don't want to ruin it, but you can kind of see that Ben Haddad is things are not going well. About well, they're about to not go well for him. But so yes, but he goes over there. Yes, to, to make this guy think. He's yeah. not an Israelite. No. So then we're now back over in Israel. Uh huh. Okay. Yep. So all these people that are drinking for the code. Those are back with those are the Syrian guys. So they're not Israel, Israel, no, Israelite. No, no. These are the other. So how come they're celebrating Sukkot? Oh yeah. no, they're not. They're not. They're not celebrating the holiday of Sukkot. They're at Sukkot. So right. they're at a place called Sukkot. Oh, so there was a place. There was a, they were at a bar. <laughs> exactly. They were at the Sukkot Tavern. No, they, they were at the Sukkot Tavern. No, that's good. I'm already working. You're ready to drink at Sukkot. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. So it's interesting is, is that we are going to have a wine and cheese at Sukkot. So thank you for dropping that commercial plug in for our Sukkot wine and cheese. Uh, yeah, so we have Sukkot wine and cheese, and uh, they're drinking themselves. And by the way, the word that's used here is, uh, just to point out, shote uh, shikor, which is, uh, it says drinking themselves drunk. But what's interesting is it, it also can be, and we use that word in, in Hebrew, right? In Yiddish, shikor. Shikor means a drunk person, even today. It's not a very complimentary thing to call somebody. If you say it in Yiddish, it sounds funnier, but it's still not a nice thing to say to somebody. If you say somebody's a shicker, it means they're drunk. That's the that guy's a shicker. You know, like it's dismissive because they say, you know, like what is he going to do? You know, he's 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 an alcoholic, which uh, which is not 
consider to be a good thing. Um, it closer to there or to here? Who? Here being these people. This is oh no, there. This is in. This is right on the border with Israel. Okay. So this is on the on the Jordanian side. But Sukkot literally means shelters, right? So shelters. It's a place of tents. It's a place. It's a campground. But it literally means the campground, and it does. And it doesn't mean that that there was like one campground. There were a lot of places that were called Sukkot. So these were kind of like places where where people would camp. And it's definitely more, it sounds like a more transitory place, but it's more like a stop on the way. So if you say, I stayed at Sukkot, which Sukkot did you stay at? Oh, I stayed at Sukkot in Aram, in Aram right? Stayed in Sukkot in Israel. I stayed in Sukkot in, in this case. So there are a lot of places called Sukkot, or there's a few places called Sukkot that we encounter in the Bible. But it does say that they're drinking either hard alcohol or they're drinking to the point of getting drunk. But, it looked like they were drinking scotch, like we saw the S and the H. <laughs> <laughs> they were drinking scotch. Okay, well, the interesting, the word shikor is the Hebrew word also for alcohol, for spirits. So as opposed to yain, which is wine, which is considered to be, you know, drinking that you do, necess not necessarily, it could be with your meal, right? And, and in the ancient world, they drank wine with everything. That's what they, oh yeah, they did. And they, and they are, according to this, I wouldn't actually. What does the uh, what does the King James say, by the way, Mary? Uh, the yeah, in the pavilions. So they don't even try. They don't even translate it as Sukkot as a place. Mm -hmm. They translate it as the pavilions, mm -hmm. which is again is a fancy way of saying a camp, a campground, a tent. A pavilion is a tent, you know. Not why we drink from Sukkot. No, it's not. Can, there's a. There's, there's, yeah, you could. You could. Well, you could. But this. The, the point is, they're either drinking hard alcohol or they're drinking themselves silly, and that is the point. But the word shikor, shikor is actually for hard alcohol. So that becomes to the advantage of the Israelites. Oh yeah, this is not good. This is not a good way of. They're partying too soon, which is also not a good thing to do, right? They're showing themselves to be uh, a little too arrogant and cocky, not a lot of humility. They're already partying before the battle was even fought. But they, you know, they say, we got a big army here. They don't think the Israelites are going to fight. And so here's what happens. The aides of the provincial governors rushed out first. Ben-Hadad sent scouts who told him, some men have come out from Samaria. He said, if they have come out to surrender, take them alive. And if they've come out for battle, take them alive anyhow. <laughs> he clearly he's a little drunk because he's basically just saying i don't kill him just capture him and, and and there's a certain again dismissiveness to it which is like i'm not really worried about these guys they're not gonna yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly yep but the others the aides of the provincial governors with the army behind them had already rushed out of the city and each of them struck down his opponent. The Arameans fled and Israel pursued them. But King Ben-Hadad of Aram escaped on a horse with other horsemen. The king of Israel came out and attacked the horses and chariots and inflicted a great defeat on the Arameans. Oh, wow. That wasn't exactly what people expected. That's why I said it sounds a lot like Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. They came out and they came back and they and they routed and they chased them back out. So not exactly what King Ben-Hadad had, had assumed was going to happen when he came out and was boasting and was, you know, asking for, uh, you know, give me your stuff. And it said Ahav was prepared to do it. Turned out to go a whole different direction. So our anti-hero just emerged victorious because it says he went out too. He went out and attacked with the army, which is pretty a, it's a pretty bold thing for the king to do. He rallies the troops. He tells them, look, you know, don't brag that you went out and fought if you're not going to fight. He says, I don't want to hear anybody say they went out and fought in this battle if they didn't fight. He says, you either gird a sword or you don't. So here's what happens. Then the prophet approached the king of Israel and said to him, Go, keep up your efforts, and consider well what you must do, for the king of Aram will attack you at the turn of the year. Now the ministers of the king of Aram said to him, their god is a god of mountains, and that is why they got the better of us. But if we fight them in the plain, we will surely get the better of them. So the prophet is telling Ahav, you can't stop now. You got to keep, you got to finish the job because if you don't, he's coming back. He'll come back next year and do the same thing. 
in the summertime in the time of war, right? Come back, he'll come back next year and do the same thing. And they, back in their place, Ben Haddad is getting advice from his people, which is, let's not fight them up on the hills, on the mountains. This last time, you know, we went up to Samaria and we surrounded it and we were, we were in their, in their territory. Let's, let's let them come out and fight us in the plains because their God only works in the mountains. Their God is the God of mountains. So they can't fight on the plains. Now, look, this was something that it was an issue for a long time, but it wasn't so much that God was the God of the mountains, though there is that sometimes we get that in the Bible, but there is this understanding too that, you know what, if you fight an army in the, in the flat planes you better have a pretty big army because at a pretty good strategy because there's nowhere yeah you have no advantage you have no advantage from the topography so whether god is a god of the mountains or not it just wasn't good strategy and every time israel would fight people in the from the biblical time all the way through the maccabean period every time israel had to fight people up and you know out in the plains it didn't work but it was generally because we just didn't have a large enough army to defend, you know. It's to, like to Scotland. <laughs> what? It's like Scotland. Like Scotland. Yeah, it is it's a, it is an issue, which is if you know your topography and you know where the mountain passes are and it's, you know, you have an advantage. There's no advantage you have in a flat field, right? It's just an open battle and whoever has more soldiers, more tanks, more chariots more whatever more infantry you're going to win it's almost like you're rolling the dice you're not going to you can't roll the dice enough so but in retrospect the israelites did better in the mountains because that's where god was they at least some people believe that they either believed it the 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 assyrians the the assyrians here Aram believes it. Maybe they believe. Maybe the Israelites believed it too. But whether 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 or not God was more powerful in the mountains, because again, God appears to people at Mount Sinai. You know, there's this association that God has with being up on the mountains. The the shrines were up on these mountains. That God is somehow you know up in the, in the sky and whatever. It's a good meeting point. Whatever you want to say. The reality is, is there's just the physical reality of fighting in the fields and in the plain and that's how you know there was the story of the maccabees you know judah maccabee finally got killed when he met another army in a in a field in a plain and that was it that's how judah maccabee died so whenever he fought up in the mountains he won but when he fought on the plains that's how he died uh, father was in the battle as well as canal but that's exactly what he described because when they landed it was on a beach and he said he felt like he was at Venice Beach here. They're playing volleyball and they're, you know, but the Japanese were up on the hills looking down on them and waiting for them to move forward. Yeah, if you if you have the topographical advantage is huge because, yeah, and America knew that, which is why Custer's last stand. We, but we knew that. And then we knew that when we invaded those islands that we were, we were going to get mowed down. And they did it. We had to do it anyway. Well, I don't know. We had to do it. That's the way they decided to do it. So, so yeah, it was, was not easy. So what did they, you know, did they believe it? Did the Israelites believe it? So, um, so here's what the, so the Assyrian, the Assyrian, the uh, Arameans are told this. Do this, remove all the Kings from their posts and appoint governors in their place. Then muster for yourself an army equal to the army you lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot. And let us fight them in the plain, and we will surely get the better of them. So he basically, they basically said, do the same thing that he did. They don't, did a purge. Don't, kings, don't use their king's private armies. Get together uh, governors who are going to you know, rally their own militias, and you'll get more people. And we'll go into battle. And here's what happened. He took their advice and acted accordingly. At the turn of the year, Ben-Hadad mustered the Arameans and advanced on effect to fight Israel. Now the Israelites had been mustered and provisioned and they went out against them. But when the Israelites encamped against them, they looked like two flocks of goats 
while the Arameans covered the land. Yeah, it does not look like a fair fight. And so this is, seems like Israel is doomed because exactly as the prophet said, he's going to come back. He's going to come back with a bigger force. And Ahab now has to deal with this. And Ahab has got his soldiers. He's got his people. He's doing the same thing he did last year, except now there's a whole lot of Arameans. Then the man of God approached and spoke to the king of Israel. Thus said the Lord, because the Arameans have said the Lord is a God of mountains, but he is not a God of lowlands. I will deliver that great host into your hands and you shall know that I am the Lord. <laughs> so the prophet, and we assume it's the same guy, right? Mm -hmm. so it says the man of God. Um, um, he said, the Arameans, you know, have this confidence and they're walking around saying that God can't fight for us in the lowlands out on the fields well god didn't like that and god's going to show you and you're going to believe finally ahab you're going to believe now in god because you see how bad it looks there's no topography there's no topographical advantage there's no question of if you win this battle it's because god did a miracle for you and I, you don't you know, you know it. And Ahab in this moment seems to finally like wrap his head around the fact that, oh, maybe God, maybe I can do the right thing. For seven days, they were encamped opposite each other. On the seventh day, the battle was joined and the Israelites struck down 100,000 Aramean foot soldiers in one day. The survivors fled to Afek inside the town, and the wall fell on the 27,000 survivors. Then Hadad had also fled and took refuge inside the town in an inner chamber. So this is not going well for the Arameans. They are literally, this is a disaster. They are a disaster. So again, you know, a lot of, lot of similarities to Russia right here. It says on the seventh day. I spent a lot of time at Kibbutz Afek. <laughs> yeah, so Afek is in Israel. Mm -hmm. That right, right? And it is right. in Israel. It's in near the, Haifa. It's what? It's, it's kind of near Haifa. Yeah, so it's in the Jezreel Valley. It's in the valley area. It's a kibbutz today, or it's been a kibbutz for a few generations, and it's a farm, right? So it's not right. a it's not a hillside, right? This there's is, a there's a little hill near there. That's probably where the, the town was. Yep. I have a little piece of pottery that I absconded with. <laughs> you well, they, we won't tell anybody. Right. right. <laughs> They're not going to come after you. But I will tell you that this is, uh, yeah, there's a kibbutz right by the biblical where we think Afek was. And it was one of these areas that, yeah, it was right on the Chesril Plain. It could, people would, it's near Megiddo. It's where, <laughs> it's where the final battle is supposed to take place. Um, and it's a complete disaster for the much more powerful and much larger country of Iran, because Iran is, is Syria, is modern day Syria, which is Damascus is the capital. Even 7,000 years ago, Damascus was a, was a fairly large city. And it, at times, it, you know, it controlled much of the entryway to the, to the Mesopotamian area, right? It was the gateway of the Tigris Euphrates Valley. And, controlled a lot of cities and at some points very, very powerful. Uh, today, you know, Syria is much larger than Israel and, and uh, it's not exactly the same dimensions as ancient Aram was, but, you know, in a similar way, this, the Syrians thought they were much more powerful than Israel, which is why when they were routed in 67, in the 67 war, they thought, well, that was just a fluke. We weren't prepared. We weren't strong enough. And so they made an alliance with the Egyptians, you know, and in 73, they attacked again, the Yom Kippur War. And for a few days, it was very precarious for Israel because on the border with Syria in the Golan Heights, the Golan was captured, was surrounded and recaptured, much of it by the Syrians. 
It's where the Valley of the Tears took place. So they just turned into a movie, the Valley of Tears. And uh, it was a very bad uh, loss of life for Israel, but Israel was able to recapture the Golan and, uh, and Syria never invaded Israel again after that. But Syria thought that they could. When it says on the seventh day, yes, is that considered the day of rest? Interesting. Is it the seventh day that, that they fought on Shabbat? Right. Well, one way or the other, something. Well, one way or the other, something happened, which is it's either the seventh day of the battle, which we'd probably most likely say after seven days the battle. That means that one of the days of the battle, no matter what, was Shabbat. So if it was on Shabbat or if it was. Uh, one way or the other. They fought on Yom Kippur. Correct. That was the that was my point. So the exactly that point. So 50 years ago, 49 years ago tonight, when Syria attacked, the, the calculation was was that Israel would be at its lowest state of readiness, which they were. Which they were. But part of the problem was is that Israel was getting conflicting information on whether or not this was going to happen because Israel had a, had a strategic advantage for a long time in understanding the you know understanding what was going on because they had really extremely highly developed intelligence gathering Israel did and what happened after at 73 war chastened Israel because Israel had had information that they were going to be attacked and people dismissed it it was it was it was given to the Israeli generals and as given to Golda Meir, who was prime minister, she ended up resigning because of the failures of the 1973 war. She resigned, and Yitzhak Rabin became uh, prime minister for his first time because of the failures and because they knew it. And Israel had a very se severe reckoning with this because they said, "Why didn't we pay attention to this? Why did we? Why did we? We saw, you know, we got military intelligence that said it was going to happen, and we didn't do it. And, the, and Israel completely changed." The way it it it, it dealt with with uh, I shared this once actually in a sermon a bunch of years ago because what Israel did was is they said if we get any intelligence that says something's going to happen we never dismiss it as what oh no it was mentioned in that movie but it was also mentioned in a movie you never expect Does anyone know World War Z. World War Z mentioned it in the zombie movie with Brad Pitt. The Israelis, the Israelis say to, because Brad Pitt goes to Israel and says, how are you guys prepared for this zombie invasion? He says, because we got information that it was happening. And, he's, and, the, and the general says to Brad Pitt, after 73, he actually says, and the guy who wrote the book, World War Z, is a guy named Matt Brooks, who's Mel Brooks' son. And he knows what Israel did. And he, it's, well, we know what Israel did. Israel said, if we get any information, and this is the line in the movie, we do not dismiss any information. We, we try to find out if anything, even the most remote possibility, if it could be true, we, we investigate it. And so that's how he said what we learned after 73. And it's a great lesson for people, which is never think that if you get some information and you say, ah, there's no way, don't ever take that as a, as a way to behave. Because if you, it's not that you have to be suspicious about everything, but don't dismiss things as, as, as not possibilities. Pearl Harbor. There's so many things that people say, but think about how many times it happens in your life where you just say, you get the information, you say, ah, oh, there's no way that that can happen. And it becomes a, a, it becomes a problem. And even for us who, for those of us who don't think we're arrogant or we're, or we're beyond, uh, you know, we're, we're that confident all the time, we still do it because we want to do it. We don't want to think about what the worst case scenario is. And, and if you get information and you say, well, well let, me, let me find out. I mean, maybe it's not possible, but, but let's at least investigate. Let's not dismiss it. Doesn't it seem like since World War II that the United States has kind of done that? Well, we've been very dismissive of government. Look, I don't, we don't know how many people were supposedly told about 9-11. There is a version that Israel warned the United States about it, and they dismissed it. And Israel, Israel said, look, we, this is the information we have. You can do with it what you want, but we find it to be, a, a, you know, this, is, this seems to be a, but again, I don't, who knows what really happened? I mean, people, people don't know. And that's why people say that, you know, 
Roosevelt intentionally dismissed, you know, the warnings he had so that America would be drawn into the war because they said there was the information. They did. They found the the they found the the communications which show that there were warnings that people knew that the Japanese were 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 potentially going to strike Pearl Harbor. But you know, there are people who said, and Roosevelt intentionally allowed it to happen because he wanted to be able to join the war. Yeah, and there's people who felt that. Bush. Yeah, and, but but he didn't think he had enough support for it domestically. Look, there's people who said that that's what happened on 9-11, that we purposely dismissed the intelligence so that we would be drawn into war. Look, it's not like they hadn't tried to attack the same building before. The World, the World Trade Center was bombed in 1983. I mean, it had been bombed. So anyways, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting situation where people dismiss the information that they have. Uh, well, let's get back to Ben Haddad. He takes refuge in the inner chamber. His ministers said to him, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are magnanimous kings. Let us put sackcloth on our loins and ropes on our heads and surrender to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will spare your life. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and wound ropes around their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, your servant Ben-Hadad says, I beg you, spare my life. He replied, is he still alive? He is my brother. Wow. So, uh, so Ben-Hadad, who had started off by saying, I'm going to take everything away from, from, from Ahab, winds up going to beg for, for forgiveness. And it is very, very mafia-like, which is, you know, I went to war against this guy. I lost. And now I'm going to go beg him so he'll spare my life. Is the rope around their heads a noose? It's like a noose. It's basically saying I'm a slave. It's not a noose. It's a slave. I'm your slave. So this is a symbolic I'm your slave business. Uh, and so I screwed up. I humble myself before you. And look what he says. The men divined his meaning and quickly caught the word from him, saying, Yes, but then Ben Hadad is your brother. Go bring him, he said. Ben Hadad came out to him and he invited him into his chariot. Ben Hadad said to him, I will give back the towns that my father took from your father, and you may set up bazaars for yourself in Damascus, as my father did in Samaria. And I, for my part, said Ahab, will let you go home under these terms. So he made a treaty with him and dismissed him. So he gets back. Oh, yeah, but they have a beautiful treaty here, which is I'm going to give back the property in the north of Israel that my father took from your father, right? So Omri lost territory in the north. I'm going to give it back to you. You guys are going to get that territory back. And I'm going to allow you to do business in my capital, right? So you'll be able to set up shops in my capital you'll be able to do business there and ahab says okay that's a good deal i'll take that deal and he made a treaty with them so what turned out what we thought was going to be a disaster for ahab turns out to be a big win so ben hadad was utterly defeated and had to beg for his life and and he gets it he gets his life and here's what happens a certain man, a disciple of the prophets, said to another at the word of the Lord, strike me. But the man refused to strike him. He said to him, because you have not obeyed the Lord, a lion will strike you dead as soon as you leave me. And when he left, a lion came upon him and killed him. This is a weird way That's of weird. proving that you're a prophet. Uh, a prophet, it says a prophet or at least a disciple of the prophet, said to one of the other group of these prophets. And again, it says, which literally means the sons of prophets. That's probably what the King James says, right? We understand that it probably doesn't literally mean sons, that these are the disciples, which is why they translated it as such. It means that, you know, they're from the, the group of prophets. That This is like, they're the next generations of prophets, uh, they're maybe not full prophets yet, but they're coming up as prophets. And so this one, so 
when Reverend Lynn asked, is this, are we going to see some prophecy? Oh yeah, we're going to see some prophecy and you're going to see some weird prophecy. This is, we, we've seen Elijah's prophecy. We've seen this other unnamed prophet. Now we see this other prophet, which again, seems to be another prophet. Uh, and then we're going to see a named prophet. Uh, the theme of prophecy is going on here. So as much as this is a story of the battle between Aram and, and Ahab and, and Israel, right? There's really a story of, of prophets. No, this is, pro well, there might have been a priest behind this, right? There might have been a priest who wrote this, but the story doesn't really, like the story doesn't make sense from the standpoint of like, what was the agenda of who wrote this story? I know what you're trying to ask. I, I, I don't know. Re when we read the story, you tell me what, like who would write this story? Okay, so Elijah, well, Elijah's in the background. We don't know. He's not, he hasn't come back home yet. He hasn't come back. This is not Elijah. These are other prophets doing this work. So Elijah is out of the picture right now, but he's not gone. He's not, he hasn't gone. And it's weird because this is what's happening without Elijah. So one, so a prophet says to another disciple, one of one of his colleagues, hit me. The guy says, no. And he goes, okay, if you didn't obey me, now you're going to eat my lion. And sure enough, a lion eats him. By the way, there was a lion in Pico Canyon Park last week. Yeah, that was a close. The park, the there was something biting. That's right behind my house. It attacked a seven-year-old kid. Yeah. 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 So, I was walking my dog a mile away from that at my house. Okay. I'm like, every night I'm like, maybe this, maybe the lion's gonna come after me now. Yeah. And my dog. dog. And my dog. So they didn't find no, I don't think so. I don't know. So they were there. The lion was actually there. I was thinking about that lion. <laughs> I love lions, but I don't want to get bit by one. It's my spirit animal, but I don't want to get bit by one. All right. So then he goes to another guy. Here we go. Then he met another man and said, come strike me. So the man struck him and wounded him. Then the prophet, disguised by a cloth over his eyes, went and waited for the king by the road. So he does get somebody to hit him. Uh, and hit him enough to wound him. Hi. Which is weird because he asked for it. And it's almost as if he said to the... He, so when he asks to be hit and to be wounded, he's literally doing it so that he can act out this prophetic role. I don't know who he is because he has a cloth over his Well, body. now it says he is, right? So the guy gets hit and wounded by another prophet or another, another it says another man, but could be a prophet. Maybe he didn't ask a prophet the next time. He just said, I ain't gonna get a, I'm not going to get a prophet to hit me. So I'm going to ask some guy on the street to hit me. But that's part of his deal. Like he wants to get hit. So he looks wounded. Like he asked for it to put on this show that he's about to put on. So he, he literally, like the first guy goes, I want to hit you. He goes, well, yeah, I need to be hit and because you didn't listen to me. God wants me to do this. You're going to die. So Next guy does it, though. So here he is. As the king passed by, he cried out to the king and said, Your servant went out into the thick of the battle. Suddenly a man came over and brought a man to me, saying, Guard this man. If he is missing, it will be your life for his, or you will have to pay a talent of silver. While your servant was busy here and there, the man got away. The king of Israel re responded, You have your verdict. You pronounced it yourself. Quickly, he removes the cloth from his eyes, and the king recognized him as one of the prophets. So this weird scene where he basically acts out this scene and says, uh, well, let's read what happened. Let's finish it up. He said to him, thus said the Lord, because you have set free the man whom I doomed, your life shall be forfeit for his life and your people for his people. Wow. So the prophet basically says to him, you see, he acts this scene out for him. Um, you had a job to do, Ahav. You were supposed to kill Ben Hadad. I wanted to teach everyone a lesson. God is basically saying through this prophet, I wanted to teach a, everyone a lesson that I mean business. And that if you try to attack my people, if you try to attack me, l lower my credibility, you're you're gonna pay the price. 
So Ahav, maybe thinking he's being generous and been, you know, beneficent to this uh, this guy Ben Hadad, ends up being punished because he was not supposed to do that. He was supposed to do what he was supposed to do, which was wipe out the Arameans and destroy this king and teach them a lesson. So you had a job to do. You were given a job. You were told this is what you were supposed to do, and you didn't do it. Now, at first, of course, the prophet tells him like he did it, like this is a situation, like I was given a job to do, and I didn't do it. And he says, well, you've, you, you've, you're going to be punished. And he takes off his cover. He says, no, it's you. You were the one. So again, it's the same kind of thing that Nathan did when he went to King David and said, you know, a guy, a, a guy had uh, all these lambs and this other guy had only one lamb and you took that lamb, right? That was the Bathsheba little, the Bathsheba little play. Now he says, this guy told me I have to be in charge of this. I, di I didn't do it. What do I, you know, and King says, oh, you're done. And then he says, it's you. You're the, you're the one who did this. So Ahab was just taught a lesson by the prophet that, and he essentially condemned himself. He got tricked into condemning himself. Dispirited and sullen, the king of Israel left for home and came to Samaria. Yeah. So he knew he screwed up. So Ahab is an interesting character because he's definitely not a good person. And he doesn't do what he's supposed to do in many cases. And he kills prophets of Israel with his wife's goading. He does it. It's not his idea necessarily, but he did go through with it. He's very smart, it seems. He's a good battle. He's good in battle. He's a good leader, battle leader, whatever, a general. I don't know what you could ever call him. He's a good, he's an inspiring character. He knows how to manipulate his people and get them to do what they need to do. But he every time is given a, ch a chance to do the right thing and follow God's rule, he steps out and doesn't do it. So he seems like he's given chances. Ahav is given chances. Now there's a problem, which is that as bad as he is from our vantage point, as bad as he is, I mean, he was the rival, was the, was the, was the, was the tormentor of Elijah, him and his wife. He must have been a good king. He must have been successful. I mean, we read he was. I mean, it's not like a surprise. We just read he defeated a much bigger Aramean army. But he must have been a very successful king. How many years did he You're going to see, but it's 25 years. 25 years. A long time to be king. At a time when people are getting, like, right before him, well, when his dad became king, remember, his dad was part of a coup that killed a guy who was a king for a week. A guy who was a king for two years before that. This guy is a good, he's a good, strong ruler, Ahab. But he wasn't a nice, he wasn't good to, he wasn't following God, that's for sure. Now we're going to read the story that we read Wednesday night. Yes. What? Thanks. Well. Yeah, well, it's it is it is it is a weird story from the standpoint of like what's going on there because it's a it's a it's a play right it's a play inside the story, which is not easy to follow always right it's not always easy to follow what's 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 going on with a play within the play, because you know like Shakespeare did that and it's sometimes you're like well what's what's the play really you know what is what's going on in the play but it's it is weird when you have a story within a story, and you're not exactly sure. Uh, like, but but the details of it are interesting because basically, if you think about it, even the story within the story, there's this weird story which is some prophet got mauled by a killed by a lion because he didn't follow the, the directions, which is I guess the takeaway from it, which is you better follow directions when God is the one giving the directions. You better follow the directions. But it's weird because like you know if some guy asked you to hit that hit him. Be like, I'm not going to hit you. Why would I hit you? Why would I hit you? And the guy ends up dying because he doesn't follow directions. So the fact that Ahab really doesn't follow directions, he's going to pay the price. But remember, Ahab was warned before because Ahab was told by another prophet 
if you don't finish this guy off, he's going to come back next year. And it's exactly what happened. And they had to have a fight. And again, you know, look, you, on one hand, you go, well, Ahab is just being magnanimous. He's just being humane. He's just keeping a guy alive. But, but at a certain point, if you know these people are going to keep attacking you, you're not doing anything magnanimous. You're, you're, people are going to die because of this. You had a, you had a threat. You had to, you had to neutralize that threat. You had a chance to wipe out this threat, and you didn't do it. And when the guy came back, look, we won the war, but there were Israelites that died. There were Israelite soldiers who died the second time that that Ben Hadad came back. So if you had followed the rules, you would have you would have stopped another war. So he didn't, you know, he didn't do the right thing. He allowed another war to happen. So sometimes we got to follow the directions because as much as you'd say, well, God wanted him to kill this guy. Well, yeah, maybe by killing him, he would have saved a lot more lives. The guy wouldn't have come back. So this is the story of Nabot. And this is the story that we talked about uh, on Wednesday night because it illustrates the breaking of the Ten Commandments in a very, very visible and... Uh, it's a weird story. It's one chapter, and it's a story in itself. And we're going to read it right now. And you'll see why, why, to some extent, the Israelites are thrown out of their country, why they're exiled. This might be the, the final story, you if you will. Real quick, that from, I guess, around here until, until they get um, exiled, they broke all 10 commandments. And here they go. And when you think about the commandments, which sometimes, like some of the commandments are like, now, now thou shalt not murder, not committing adultery, not stealing. Those are all like, oh, well, the adultery story is the story of King David, right? Exactly. And that's what seems pretty, pretty obvious, right? But then you get to this interesting law, right? What a lot of people forget the ninth commandment right after the not to kill, not to murder, not to steal. What do we get? Don't bear false witness. We're like, oh my gosh, that's kind of a weird one. You don't bear false witness against somebody in court. That's such a that's such an important issue that that's in the Ten Commandments. People forget that one. The two that people forget the most are that one and then not to covet, the last one. And you go like coveting. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. Guess what? In court specifically, right? Don't testify against your neighbor. No, that's ninth, the tenth one. But the ninth one is the one that people forget, which is that which because it doesn't seem as big as the other ones, right? It's a serious one. Watch what happens in this scene. Watch the following what... events occurred sometime afterward. Naboth the Jezreelite owned a vineyard in Jezreel, adjoining the palace of King Ahav of Samaria. Ahav said to Naboth. Give me your vineyard so that I may have it as a vegetable garden, since it is right next to my palace. I will give you a better vineyard in exchange, or if you prefer, I will pay you the price in money. But Nabot replied, the Lord forbid that I should give up to you what I have inherited from my fathers. So, he's the king. He's asking nicely. I'll pay you for it. But Nabot said, no, it's not mine. It's my inheritance. It's going to my kids. I inherited it. I'm given. So it's my property. I'm not giving it up. The guy said, I'll give you other property. It's not like he says, I'm not going to pay you for it. I'll give you another vineyard. I'll give you a better vineyard. He wants that one, right? And this is the problem. This is exactly what coveting is, right? Not that, and people say, well, what's the problem with wanting what your neighbor has? And the rabbis say, it's not. That's not what coveting is. Company isn't saying, I want a BMW because my neighbor has a BMW. So I want that BMW. I want his BMW. And I can't be satisfied unless I have his BMW, which means he doesn't have it anymore. Again, it's not like seeing your neighbor's wife and going, I'd really like to have a wife like my neighbor. No, I want that wife. I want that woman in particular. It's only that woman that will give me any kind of peace of mind. That's the problem. That's what coveting is. It's that desire and focus, not for something, but for that one thing, not for 
not for a generic version of it, but for that one thing. So he says, I want that vineyard. I want your vineyard. Now, of course, you can imagine this is not going to end well for Nabot. Ahav went home dispirited and sullen because of the answer that Nabot the Jezreelite had given him. I will not give up to you what I have inherited from my fathers. He lay down on his bed and turned away his face, and he would not eat. Yeah, he, seen, he sounds like a petulant baby, mm -hmm. but he is not happy. He does not want to be told no, right? And so this is not a good day for King Ahab. Yeah, he is not. This is, this is really, again, I, you know, he does not, he does not want to eat. Yes. And here's what his wonderful wife Jezebel will say. His wife Jezebel came to him and asked him, why are you so dispirited that you won't eat? So he told her, I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and proposed to him, sell me your vineyard for money, or if you prefer, I'll give you another vineyard in exchange. But he answered, I will not give my vineyard to you. Which isn't exactly what he said, but I mean, it's the gist of what he said, right? He said, I'm not, I said, no, I'm not going to give it to you. He actually said, it's not really mine to give. It's our family's property. We've been there for years. I don't want to give you my family's property, which is a legitimate issue. As one could make the argument, it, you know, the, the Torah says that tribes are not supposed to give up their property to other tribes. I mean, it's, it's like, it's, it's our tribal portion. So I said, no. He tells his wife, I won't, he said he won't do it. So here's what Jezebel says. His wife Jezebel said to him, now is the time to show yourself king over Israel. Rise and eat something and be cheerful. I will get the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite for you. <laughs> so, so Jezebel, you know, likes to worship other gods mm -hmm. and goddesses. She worships, she worships, she worships, <laughs> she worships, uh, um, and um, now she's a problem solver. She's a problem solver. She says, "I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, do, I'll take care of it." So she says, "She says she says you, but she also says, you know, grow some stones." Is what she says to him. She says that to him. She doesn't just say, "I will take care of it." It says it's time for you to show yourself king. So there is this sense of like, you know, be a man. That's what she says. You're the king. And, you know, so there isn't just I'll take care of it. But, you know, you know, we got it. You got, this isn't good. This isn't good for you. This isn't good for you. Maybe this isn't, doesn't make us look good. So here's what she says. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who lived in the same town with Naboth. In the letters, she wrote as follows. Proclaim a fast, and seat Naboth at the front of the assembly, and seat two scoundrels opposite him, and let them testify against him. You have reviled God and king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So she literally... The way we're going to get rid of Nabot is she by... She frames him. This is the wife killing her husband, getting her husband killed? No, no it's... it's she's she's oh, telling... Well, she's Exactly. So this is the breaking... Uh, this is the one that breaks the two hardest commandments for us to say, like, well, how would this ever go into place, right? Who would ever break that commandment? Like, how... I guess you could break it, but give me a... Give me a, give me an example. Here's your example. Here's your example of coveting and what it leads to, which is the commandment before the ninth and 10th commandments testifying against falsely, because it's not just a matter of it, it's, it's literally oh, technically murder too. But. You see this with the, uh, I, and I don't know names, please forgive me. The, the when the woman was in her home and the king was in his and he's watching the pretty woman. That's yeah, that's Bathsheba. Okay. That's but that's definitely 
that, that's definitely coveting, but it's also the previous commandments, which are adultery, right? So there's adultery and murder, if you will. Yeah, legal murder. But he has he has this he has a guy he has a guy killed. Remember that was the previous. I know it was a long time ago, but that was the previous book of the Bible. That was the book of Samuel. So then this is the book of Kings. Okay, well you they know they know because they were you know, they were there on Wednesday last, so they know what my point is. So here's the we got to watch it play out. So this is her plan, and here's what happens. That his townsmen, the elders and nobles who lived in his town, did as Jezebel had instructed them, just as was written in the letters she had sent them. They proclaimed a fast and seated in a boat at the front of the assembly. Then the two scoundrels came and sat down opposite him, and the scoundrels testified against Naboth publicly as follows, Naboth has reviled God and king. Then they took him outside the town and stoned him to death. Word was sent to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, Go and take possession of the vineyard which Naboth the Jezreelite refused to sell you for money. For Naboth is no longer alive. He is dead. Which is a nice way of saying he's dead, right? He's no longer alive. He's dead. He's the other thing. Dead. Yep. So to break the fast, which is interesting, right? Because it's exactly what we do at Yom Kippur. So you're creating a fast. You create basically a, a pretext, which is really a serious pretext. Because if you're saying we're having a fast, that's a religious type of thing, right? It's a spiritual moment. And so what Jezebel just did is she used religion, if you will, to create a religious event. Break it. We're breaking the fast. We have a fast. The fast, yeah, the fast comes to an end. We're going to break the fast like we do at the end of Yom Kippur, which you're all invited to tomorrow night. At, not tomorrow night, Wednesday night at 7. That is tomorrow. No, the break the fast. Break the fast. It's Arab. Oh, that's true. What am I talking about? Mark, you got to be here tonight. Okay? I have to be here tonight? Are you telling me by tomorrow night this all... Are you telling this will all be over by tomorrow night? By tomorrow night, it'll all be over. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Somebody have a fast tomorrow, tonight. Anyways, yeah, so this is a perfect time to... No, it's a perfect time to read this, right? Which is they, they're going to break the fast. They have this, They have this moment to be together. And this is a perfect time to, to have this guy. Uh, we'll set him up. Yes. <laughs> We're going to set this guy up. And that's what they did. They set this guy up using a pretext of a religious. It's terrible. So she has him killed. And no, they were doing what they're supposed to do, which is protect. Prote so what we learn from this, by the way, is we don't rely on the testimony of two people, right? Especially in the capital offense. By the rabbinic period, you had to have witnesses to the witnesses to the witnesses to the witnesses. You couldn't just say, well, two guys say, remember, you, they had at least two guys. At least they had two guys, right? But yeah, now they have witnesses. What? Oh, no. I, I, oh, you're saying you even blame the guys who did it. Oh, I, I mean, Mike, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I run away. I, you're right. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, you don't want to say no, but if you, if you realize these people are, first of all, are never named. Right. She says from the beginning, you hire two scoundrels, That's right? True. So we know that the guys who are doing it are not good people that are, that are doing it, but but she wrote letters. No, but you're right from the standpoint. No, Michael, you're you're right by the by the set that she sent the letters to the elders and nobles who lived in the same town as Naboth. So the, the the complicity here is all throughout the system. There is no question. It wasn't just the scoundrels who do it. They're 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 only too happy to do it because that's what they do. They're scoundrels. But yeah, the the power, the people who didn't say no to. Jezebel in the first place, you make the argument they're afraid. But on the other hand, what kind of system do they have? I mean, in today, today's world, that's just 
Yeah, but remember, when, Jeze when Jezebel does this, it doesn't say who she did it with. Right. When David gets Uriah killed, he only has to have one guy working with right. him. It only has one guy. He has, he, has, he has Yoav put this guy up at the front lines, and it doesn't require a whole, there's not a whole conspiracy here. This is a whole conspiracy to get this guy killed. You yourself, when you speak, people listen to you. That's what you really you never say. This guy's a bad guy, or this, or or politically. This unless guy's unless bad. unless they really are, unless they really are. I try not to, but I realize I realize that some people might say, "Is <laughs> might they somebody might 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 uh, yeah." I don't I, I don't want I wouldn't do that. But anyways. So, well, keep that in mind. That's all I'm going to tell you. So <laughs> that's all I'm going to tell you is I never tell people who did. I would not, I wouldn't do that. So, uh, so Ahab is, uh, Ahab is very happy because what happens? Read it, Rosemary. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab sent out for the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, Go down and confront King Ahab of Israel, who resides in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard. He has gone down there to take possession of it. Say to him, thus said the Lord, would you murder and take possession? Thus said the Lord, in the very place where the dogs lapped up Naboth's blood, the dogs will lap up your blood too. Yeah, dogs do that. Dogs do that. I know, well, dogs will do that. They like blood. Um, they, uh, yeah, here's Elijah came back. So Elijah just a lot. Yeah. Elijah just got brought back into the story and he's brought back according to the story. God told him to go to, you got to go to Ahab, to Ahab and confront him. And so this is what happens. Um, you know, Ahab got his way. He got what he wanted. He's sitting in the vineyard. And uh, and Elijah's told, go confront them. Go confront them. And you're going to tell them, you killed this guy? In the same place where his blood was spilled, your blood will be spilled too. Well, he's responsible. He knew it. He knew what happened. He knew what had happened. Yeah, well, yeah. You're right. He could say my wife told me to do it, but yeah, that's not going to that's not going to cut it with him. Ahab said to Elijah, "So you have found me, my enemy?" "Yes, I have found you," he replied, "because you committed yourself to doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord. I will bring disaster upon you. I will make a clean sweep of you. I will cut off from Israel every male belonging to Ahab, bond and free." And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, son of Ahia, because of the provocation that you have caused by leading Israel to sin. Yeah, and so Elijah says to him, you know the previous two dynasties that didn't last very long for Israel? You're going to be like those guys. You're going to be like the house of Jeroboam, and you're going to be like the house of Baasha, but don't even last two you know, beyond two generations. You are doomed. And, you know, Elijah has now reconfronted Ahab, told him what's going to happen. And look at what, look at what Ahab's reaction is, right? You know, you're my, en my enemy, right? You come and found me, my enemy. And that's his reaction at first. But now... He's been told this information. Look what happens. And the Lord has also spoken concerning Jezebel. The dogs shall devour Jezebel in the field of Jezreel. All of Ahab's line who die in the town shall be devoured by dogs. And all who die in the open country shall be devoured by the birds of the sky. Yeah, so that's a pretty harsh Psalm talks about the dogs licking uh, the wounds of. Well, I will tell you that we read about uh, dogs a couple times. Well, we read about it, uh, the dogs in Exodus recently, so that's in my head, because the dogs don't bark 
when the angel of death is passing through right. Egypt. And one of the things we just read in Exodus is also is that the dogs will um, get to eat all of your torn animals. But so you're talking about you're talking about no you're talking about a psalm that talks about one of the psalms does talk about dogs uh, doing similar things which is licking blood. Um, let me just tell you which psalms that which psalm it is. Um, and no, I don't have it's Psalm. Uh, uh, yeah, it's Psalm sixty-eight. It is uh, now that your feet wait in the blood of your foes, while the tongues of your dogs have their share. That might have been it. Was that it? Was it a different one? Actually, it was a different one that I was thinking. But that is another piece. Uh, yeah. So, um, let's see. No, I don't see another one that would be. Oh. I, it could be another one, but it could. There could be another one about about um, dogs. But dogs, yeah, usually are not doing good things in the Bible. They are um, still fairly um, wild, and they they eat stuff that no nobody else wants to eat. So, uh, oh, you know what else? Dogs are mentioned in Psalms twenty two. Oh, because in the famous Eli Eli Lama Sabachthani, right? Yes. Oh Lord, oh Lord, why have you forsaken me? It says the dogs surround me, which some people also interpret to mean um, they translate it as dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. That's a pretty famous. Yeah, that's a that's a famous scene, right? Um because uh, that is what's carried out. Psalm 22 is what's carried out in the, at, the, at the crucifixion, literally word for line for line. So many people say that the whole purpose of the crucifixion scene is actually to bring about the, uh, a, a vision or an or a example of Psalm 22. So when Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama zamakani, he doesn't just say the first line of the psalm. He actually says the entire psalm by what happens in the next scene, which is being pierced, you know, being surrounded by people who are mocking him. So, uh, yeah, this is also not a good scene. It's a scene where, again, you're supposed to be uh, um, scared by this, which is he's being told that your wife is also going to wind up and your kids. Yeah, but probably more to um, take care of the sheep and to chase away the wild wolves instead of necessarily wanting to have dogs with them. So they probably weren't so domesticated, but uh, still packs of wild, wild dogs, dogs were still on around. They didn't have the chihuahua, the yeah. chihuahua, but uh, they did not have a writer like I have, which is a, you know, golden doodle. They didn't have many golden doodles at this time. These were, these were probably a uh, little bit more like, like dingoes, <laughs> dingo, dingo. All right, so um, yeah, the last word on Ahab right here. Indeed, there never was anyone like Ahab who committed himself to doing what was displeasing to the Lord at the instigation of his wife, Jezebel. Which, by the way, there lays a lot of the blame at her feet. <laughs> it doesn't say that he's without fault, but it, he also say a lot of it had to do with Jezebel, his wife. But it doesn't say it's all her fault. I want to make it clear. It doesn't blame Jezebel. It basically says that, you know, he went along with it and he did lots of bad things. He did them. His wife didn't force him to do it. She might have instigated. She might have been part of the problem, but he did them. He acted most abominably, straying after the fetishes, just like the Amorites, whom the Lord had dispossessed before the Israelites. Yeah, so he's worshiping Canaanite gods. Just like the Canaanites, or the, they're sometimes called the Amori, the Canaanites. These are this is why we don't have this. This is why the Canaanites were kicked out because they were doing bad things, and he's doing the bad things too. But look what happens to Ahab. When Ahab heard these words, he rent his clothes and put sackcloth on his body. He fasted and lay in sackcloth and walked about subdued. Then the word of the like, Lord. So, so Ahab does teshuva. Ahab literally had just said, 
did everything that we are kind of doing at Yom Kippur. He fasted, we don't lay in sackcloth, but all these kinds of rituals are, are, you know, again, about being humbled. And he did it. He did it. Like, as bad as he was, he did it. So what do you do here? Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you seen how Ahav has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his lifetime. I will bring the disaster upon his house in his son's time. So he buys some time. So God is a big softy here. <laughs> you know, we actually, I, we, this is the last chapter. So we're actually going to read it. We're going to finish it. Oh, no, we have to. We're going to finish with it just so you don't wonder about what happens. This is the last chapter. This is the last chapter. This is chapter 22. We're going to finish with this today because this is the story of how, look, the, at some point, actually, that we won't finish with this too long. So uh, let's not. Let's not do that. We will come back next week and read how. Oh, you have to wait until next week. Yeah, to see what happens. So you have to, you have, to, you have to see, you have to see how it plays out. Uh, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible scene of uh, what happens to him eventually. But God does relent. I mean, God, God was a, God allowed Ahab to kind of buy some time, which is really interesting. Which also is a perfect message for us now, which is that. As bad as we are, because most of us aren't going to do anything as bad as Ahav, God might relent. You know, on the other hand, you only buy some time. Because, again, to some extent, what he's done is so bad that there's no way of getting it. Yeah. Well, Ahab is, yeah. I mean, the people use these images in your head of, think about, you can't think about Moby Dick. You know, you can't think about Ahab without thinking about Moby Dick and those invocations. No, that wasn't Steve Martin. Steve Martin and King Tut. Ahab the Arab was 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 older. Similar kinds of motifs of the Middle East, but no, they. Yeah, I don't think you could do the Ahab the Arab anymore. I don't think that would be. A, I know, I but I don't think you. I don't think you could be. I can do do a politically correct version of that song. So I I um. I think that uh, it's a good message for Yom Kippur, which is that you buy some. It's not a great message because the. The punishment's still coming out, but I will tell you that what we just read, to some extent, and we don't have to read the end for me to say this, which is the Israelites now have broken every one of the Ten Commandments. Why? Because they broke the first commandment. The first two commandments they broke right away. In the book of Exodus, they get the Ten Commandments. In chapter 20, they, break, they get the Ten Commandments. By chapter 32, they've broken the first two they made another god. They had another god, and they made a god of uh, out of out of gold. They broke the first two commandments. What's interesting is that in the rest of the Bible, up until right here where we're at right now, in every book of the Bible, in every one of the next books, they break a commandment. And so, my professor David Noel Friedman, a blessed memory, who was endowed chair at UCSD and at Michigan simultaneously, this guy was amazing. He was the editor of the Anchor Bible series. Amazing guy, amazing mind, and a very generous and nice person. He came up with a theory called the Unity of the Hebrew Bible, where he says that the Deuteronomistic historian, the guy, the historian or the people responsible for the history of Israel from the time of Exodus to the end of the book of Kings, which they which some people say is a unit, it's a historical unit, tells the story of the people. The actual unifying principle is this, the Ten Commandments, and how every book of the Bible, they break the commandments. So at the beginning, they break the commandments, and then they come to the book of Leviticus, where it says you're not supposed to take the name of the Lord in vain. And it says in this weird story in Leviticus that there's a guy who takes God's name in vain, and they take him out and they stone him to death because he took the... And in the fourth book of the Bible, there's a weird story about a guy gathering sticks on Shabbat, and they take him out and they kill him. They broke the Shabbat. And then in the fifth book of the Bible, I mean, literally... You come through, you, you go, oh, well, well, wait a second. There's, a, there's, a, there's actually a plan here. And what happens is, as you go through an adultery in the book of Sam, uh, in, the, in the story of, of David, in the book of Samuel, and then you get to the, this story. And there's even a story of, the, of theft in the book of Joshua that he points out. There's a story of how, how some of the, in, in one of the battles we read about, how they stole some property from one of the battles. And they killed a guy who was responsible in the Battle of Ai. And you're wondering, why is that story in the Bible? Well, Friedman's theory is the story in the Bible is there 
to set up this, this, this big story, which is, oh my gosh, they broke every one of the, and, and, and the story of, of Batsheva is there to tell you, oh my gosh, it, adultery happens every day, but this happened on a national level with the king. And then we have this horrible story of Navot in the vineyard, which is in the book of Kings. And sure enough, we have coveting and we have testifying against somebody in court falsely. And after the Israelites broke every one of the commandments, God says, I'm done with you. And at the end of Kings, we read about the exile. Why? Because they broke the, they broke the covenant. They had a covenant. What? At the end of Kings. Well, yeah. And now, now again, to some extent, that's the end of the history. Now, there's a version of it in Chronicles, which is the way the Hebrew Bible ends. But Chronicles is another telling of the book of Kings. So the last books of the Bible are a repetition of this with, with added stuff. It's not like there's not. I mean, there's stuff in the book of Chronicles that we don't have in Kings. But what the point is, is it ends the same place, which is, I mean, Chronicles goes a little further, which is they get to come back. But, but what the book of Kings ends with is, oh my gosh, now I understand why we got exiled. Because we broke every one of the commandments on a, on a national level. Personal theory, because I know everything that you say, that's why it's wrong, is that you don't say to the children, don't write on the wall unless they're writing on the wall. Yeah. And I wonder if um if um children of Israel were were doing all these things and therefore they needed the commandments. So, yeah, it, it also could be, look, we know that there's commandments in the Bible throughout the Bible. It's not just the Ten Commandments. But what's interesting about the Ten Commandments is they're set up as a covenant, right? They're set up as an agreement. You keep these rules. You all heard them. And I'm your God, and, and I'll take care of you, and you get to stay in the land. You get to stay in the land. But they broke every one of them. And so what's interesting is they literally go down, and you go, tick. To, oh, you broke down, you broke down, you broke down. Anyway, well, so yeah, but it could be that it's set up. It could be that the setup is, is to some extent that the Ten Commandments were seen by the people, whatever the commandments were. It's very possible that, yes, the Ten Commandments were articulated in such a way that however, the, it is possible that the Ten Commandments were written after every one of these things had been broken. But we know that there's commandments. We know that there's a set of obligations that the Israelites had to follow. Whatever it was, there's a sense that there is an agreement here they had with God, that they had rules to follow. What's interesting about it is that the rules are incumbent on everybody, but when they're broken in such a way that the, that the, that the, that the and this is Friedman's theory, is that when they're broken on a national level, there's no, there's no question that, the, that everyone's responsible for this and everyone has to be punished because it's not one person doing it and they're like, well, that guy did it. I didn't do it. It's done on a national level with national, with national, uh, if not, if not recognition of it or, or, or complicity with it, everybody knew it. Matter of fact, one of the, the confessionals that we use is, um, quite read the word it's a long time, but the sins that I've committed and the sins committed on my behalf. Yeah. We do that. We do that. Too. We're doing that at Yom Kippur. We actually say that for sins that we've committed knowingly and unknowingly, for sins that we've committed in ourselves and then leading other people astray. We say for 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 being led astray and for leading others astray. That we from. Correct. Correct. Which is which is a problem on a national level, because we we can say to ourselves, well, where is this coming from? Who's responsible for this? Because it's because it's us. I mean, that's the that's the line, you know, from sympathy with the devil that the so powerful that the stones wrote, you know, who killed the Kennedys? After all, it was you and me, and that's the and that's the that's the lesson of you know collective responsibility. We can't say in a country where we actually do get to elect our leaders and where we do get to have some say, which again, this was a monarchy. So they, they, they gave up that willingly. Remember the people asked for a King and Samuel says, you know, if you do that, you're going to be collectively responsible because 
there, there was this sense, this sense that the king is only doing what you're, what you allow him to do, what you want to do. And what happens in the story we just read? The king didn't. The king didn't do it by himself. The 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 elders of the town, the nobles of the town, were complicit with with him and allowed it to happen. Whoever does it, whoever is responsible, if they're responsible with the with the with the with the assent and with the support of the people, the people are responsible. And that's the interesting takeaway from the Bible is it doesn't it doesn't allow us to say, well, that was King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. They were horrible people. No, because these scoundrels who took part in it, the people of the town that, that were complicit in it, just like whoever helped David kill Uriah, yeah, David was responsible for it. He gets punished for it. But everyone's responsible. And, it, and it's interesting that God will punish the people responsible. But God also seems to be able to get talked into, which I don't know. I mean, you can say, you can say it's not very, look, God just says, yeah, you know what? And he says to Elijah, literally like, like I, look at it, look at this guy. He, did, he got the message. And it's so weird that God would be like proud of Ahab. But he's like, yeah, Ahab, Ahab's actually sorry for what he did. So that's why I said God seems to be a softy, but God does seem to want people to do the right thing. The story that Mary told me, the Queen of Hots was going to kill, take care of the atheists. Uh huh. And then the end of their lives is God. Well, well there's no atheists in foxholes, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's a point, there's a there's a point where 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 people will feel that. But Ahab, for whatever Ahab does. We saw it before when he, when he saw Elijah go to battle against against the priests of Baal. That, that that at that moment Ahab's like, yeah, God is the right God. God's the real God, and so he gets it sometimes, and then he keeps falling back. But Ahab's an interesting character because Elijah and him have this battle with each other. They have this, oh, well, at least on Ahab's side, he has an admiration, a grudging admiration for Elijah. He doesn't kill Elijah when he comes in. He doesn't want to hear necessarily what Elijah has to say, but he reacts to what Elijah says. He, he actually tries to repent. So it's not, it's, it's a complicated relationship. It's definitely not so straightforward that Ahab is a horrible guy and is. They have, uh, you know, prayed to idols and to other gods, but he's, he's still a Hebrew. And he still responds to God. Yeah, exactly. He still responds, and there's a piece of him that's not completely bad. Right. It's why it's such a complex. This is why the Bible is such a great text. You can, how can you read that last part where Elijah basically is pulled aside by God and said, "Look at look at this guy. He gets it. Ahab Ahab gets it." You know what Elijah doesn't respond. Elijah's, you know, Elijah's probably rolling his eyes, right? The word that came to Elijah, have you seen? Doesn't say what Elijah's response is. Doesn't say Elijah. Elijah's probably saying to himself, gosh, God did it again. And Jesus does offer. I mean, does he? Oh, yeah. Really, it's very disturbing. A couple of weeks ago, he, uh, what was the situation? Oh. He says to his followers, look at these bad guys and look how they profit in the world. You ought to perhaps be a little more like that. He said that? Yes. Well, so, some people, some people, some people are saying, you know, learn from That's learn, true. learn from their behavior, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe we can take a little bit of this with us. But look, he also told people, you're gonna have to leave behind your families. That's right. You know, your family means nothing now. That's right. That's a tough message for people to hear. And especially them, and them because you were who you who your parents were, yeah. who your family who was. your who your so kids would be. The family, dump the family. She, the whole yeah, well, she she you're gonna she's gonna blow your minds is what she's gonna do. Yeah, I think I think she should. Oh, well, folks. <laughs> So everybody, have, a, have, an easy, have an easy fast, everybody. We'll see you. Uh, we hope you all get, at least you can buy some time like Ahab does. I don't know what the takeaway is, but hopefully uh, you and your kids and nobody else is going to get punished.
Uh, take care, everybody. Be well. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Rosemary. Thanks, Rabbi. Bye.